Hello, everyone. Welcome to Danger on Delmarva. My name is Rhonda Jefferson, and I'll be your host today as we explore cases and events that have happened on the Delmarva Peninsula. If you're not familiar with Delmarva, it includes all of Delaware, Maryland to the east of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge, and Virginia to the north of the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. I want to thank all of my returning listeners for tuning in. And if you're new to listening to this podcast, welcome. At the end of last episode, I said that this episode would be about a weather event. And that was what I had written up, what I was going to record for this week. But over the weekend, there were a number of severe weather events that took place around Delmarva. There were tornadoes and violent winds with lots and lots of property damage, but also, tragically, a man did die. So I'm going away from the weather event that I was going to cover just because I don't feel like it's appropriate to do at this time, knowing the, you know, all of the trauma, all of the tragedy that has happened through these tornadoes. I wanted to go on and do a different topic for today's instead of that. Um, so we will come back and revisit that event, but I, you know, again, just didn't feel like it was appropriate at this point in time. So many people are trying to rebuild you know, their homes, possibly even their careers, as there were at least some reports of farm um, equipment being damaged. I heard an irrigation system was knocked over. Um, crops could have been destroyed. And while you know, the actual property can be replaced, it you know, it won't take away from the fact that people are trying to rebuild and also that something that cannot be placed is the grandfather that passed away. Moving forward to the case that we'll be covering today, I'm going to kind of throw back to an earlier episode or actually to when I um, supplied an update to it and kind of look at some of the same issues. In a previous episode, actually very early on in the podcast, I did a report about a man who killed a number of people as well as injuring many more in a shooting event that went through both Delaware and Maryland. When doing that story, I came across the fact that his brother was also in jail for murder. So that didn't make me interested in looking at you know, family-related cases, family dynamics, and more specifically, relationships between siblings. So when I did that episode, after it was published, I did some more searching, found information about his brother, and re-released that episode with those additions. Today, we will be looking at a case that involved two sets of brothers, and this also did include a shooting incident as well as, you know, um, as making threats against another person. So in this particular case, one brother was accused of shooting his brother as well as threatening two brothers earlier in the evening when they were confronted with a gun. So in something that I know is a little bit unusual, but that I think is pertinent right now is as we come about finding out the outcome of these events, it is important to remember that we are talking about and discussing people's lives. This case took place 30 years ago, and I in no way want to bring up bad memories for anyone involved. and. You know, this case, while intriguing, it does also bring up some questions that I think are kind of timeless. These are questions that are sometimes seen individually, but 
there are sometimes multiple points of interest in you know, certain crimes or incidents. So I want to show every person who is discussed in this episode respect and understanding. So I do hope that everybody sees it um, that way as well. But as with previous cases I covered, there does tend to be these questions that keep coming up over and over again, and there's seemingly no answer as to how they should be handled. So hopefully by bringing awareness and bringing forth conversation, it will help everyone understand these types of cases and the reasons behind them. Now, I did actually debate some things back and forth. As it has been 30 years, I wasn't sure if I should use the individual's full names. For one thing, they're not incredibly uncommon names in the case of the person who perpetrated the crime or allegedly perpetrated the crime. So out of respect for everybody involved, I am only going to use first names. Um, in the case of one set of brothers, they actually share the same first name. So I'll refer to them by their middle initial um, just to keep that straight. But again, this is more to show respect in the fact that it has been 30 years and I don't want to bring up things specifically towards them that may cause any pain. And while my sources will be linked in the description of the episode, if you do review those sources, they will have the full name. But, you know, if you're just interested in listening to what happened regarding the case, I will just use the first names. As a reminder, I just want to let everybody know that the content of this podcast can and usually does involve some type of injury, death, or an event that has tragically affected someone's life. This episode will also contain discussions of drug use. If this is not the type of content that you may be interested in hearing about, then I definitely understand and you may not want to listen to most, if not all of these episodes. Um, please support this podcast by sharing with your friends. Um, if you, you know, enjoy the podcast or depending on what platform you listen on, possibly leave a like or review as that helps the podcast gain in the algorithm so it's more easily found by different people. Also, in order to keep some things going, such as subscriptions I may have um, to sites that allow me to research cases, um, different databases, or you know, possibly if I ever get a Freedom of Information Act request approved, getting those copies. Um, I do have a link to a PayPal or buy me a coffee in the description if anybody would be interested in doing that. With all that being said, let's get into exactly what happened very early in the morning of August 10th, 1992 in Easton, Maryland, and the aftermath of those events. A young man named Bill committed a crime against his brother, Brian, that left Brian severely injured. In the aftermath, Bill was charged with multiple offenses, including assault with the intent to murder and battery. But that wasn't the only thing that he'd been up to that night. At a previous incident, not too long before injuring his brother, he had threatened the owner of a 7-Eleven with, with a handgun. The store was owned by a name, man named Muhammad K. And this is where I'll use his middle initial going forward. And K was just showing up to work at the 7-Eleven and to take over from his brother, Muhammad A. Muhammad K. did say it appeared that Bill was under the influence of something. And when K. asked if Bill was okay, in response to the store owner's concern, Bill took a handgun from his belt and showed him. Things at this point must have happened extremely quickly afterwards because, of course, K reported the threat to the police from Bill at 2.30 a.m. Now, also, what I'm going to be doing first is going through how the case was reported in the newspapers 
Then at the end, I am going to go over some specifics that did not actually make it into the newspaper, but were part of a court document that I found. Um, so I will let you know when we get to that point where we'll be discussing other specifics. Now, at the same time, approximately, Bill's brother, Brian, was looking for him. Brian stopped at the 7-Eleven and asked the police officer to help him find his brother. However, in realizing that this was the brother of the man that they were looking for, the police officer let Brian know that Bill had a gun and Brian was aware of this, that his brother owned a 10 millimeter and then let the officer know that he would go to his brother's home to look for him and then contact the police if Bill was actually there. Brian would try to talk his brother into turning himself in to the police. In something that no one could have anticipated, Bill shot Brian in his shoulder. And as soon as Bill realized it was his brother, he called 911 to report the incident at 245. So again, the incident at the 7-Eleven was at 2.30. Within 15 minutes, another 911 call came in to report that Bill had shot his brother, Brian. So it was a very, very quick time frame that that happened in. Uh, excuse me, Brian was taken to shock trauma. Um, I'm not sure or familiar with names of other medical centers, across the country or the world or how they function. But around here, if someone says that a person was taken to shock trauma, that means that the injury is pretty serious and normally they do have to be flown there. Now, thankfully, while Brian was initially reported as being in serious but stable condition, it was quickly upgraded to fair but stable. Bill at this time was 26 years old and was Brian's big brother. So I cannot imagine how Brian must have felt with not only the physical injuries that he sustained, but also an understanding that it was his brother that had caused that pain and that injury. So the court that week started out with a pretty shocking case with Bill facing his first hearing, which was a bond review. Now, to lend credence to the fact that, that this was a very quick and fast-moving event, Bill stated that he didn't know who was at the door when he shot, just that he shot through the door. This means that it could have been anybody standing out there. Granted, it was almost 3 o'clock in the morning, so there's not many people who should have been knocking at the door, but it could have been any family member or member of law enforcement showing up to check on him. Bill was given a $25,000 bail, but that was just for the 7-Eleven case. In that one, his defense attorney requested that it be lowered to $5,000. But for the incident of him shooting his brother, it was a $300,000 bail, and the judge also ordered a mental health evaluation. Judge William H. Atkins III said that after reading everything in the documents that he was presented with, that the incident was, quote, frightening to say the least, end quote. Now, thankfully, though Brian did suffer the gunshot injury, he was able to leave the hospital in about two weeks following the incident. Bill did go through a mental competency hearing and was found competent to stand trial. On Monday, September 1st, the total $325,000 original bail, which covered both the 7 and 11 incident and the shooting incident, that was dropped to $25,000 total. The judge who made the decision, Judge H. Thomas Sisk, was described as a visiting district judge. One of the stipulations about the bail, though, that the judge did enact was that Bill was supposed to be at an inpatient alcohol rehab, and then once discharged from that rehab, 
He was to follow a therapy regime and comply with the treatment set forward. Brian was a very forgiving and understanding brother. He said that he understood that the shooting was accidental, which Bill also claimed it was accidental. Now, while both brothers did contend this, that it was an accident, reportedly um, Bill had initially said that he didn't know who was at the door when he fired. So by making this statement, it sounds like he intentionally did pull the trigger. Bill had possibly, um, according to some of the prosecution and police's or police officers' thought process, Bill could have anticipated that a police officer was showing up at his door to arrest him for the 7-Eleven incident. Now, finding out more information as time progressed, Brian had told police that he was concerned about how Bill would react if he saw police going up to the house. So could it have been that Brian thought that once Bill saw him or heard his voice that he would put the weapon down and come out? with Brian almost acting as a go-between for his brother and the police? Or could we even look at it in terms of a statement that Bill had told the police saying, quote, I have a lot of enemies and it's a dangerous world out there, end quote. So that kind of gets you into the mindset of Bill at that time. Now, in early 1993, it was reported that drug charges against Brian that is the brother that was shot, were dropped. This was because of an administration snafu as notices that were sent for the court hearing and trial were late. So what this case was about, though, was that as the police searched Brian's vehicle, after he was shot, they did find drug paraphernalia, marijuana. So... After reviewing everything, the prosecution decided not to proceed with any charges against Brian. I do just have a question here, though. I'm wondering why they searched Brian's car. Were they just trying to get information? Um, or did they see something in plain sight that's never really discussed anywhere? But it just did leave that question in my mind. And the reason why I'm thinking about this is recently I've heard on a couple of podcasts or YouTube videos, I always have something playing on in the background whenever I'm doing stuff, but I've heard some people ask, you know, why police didn't just arrest someone right, right then or why they didn't perform a search right at that moment. There are very strict procedures that police have to follow. And one incident where I heard um, a YouTube um, creator question this, a woman had been pulled over by the police. And later, though, they found her son's body in the trunk. But they had let her go, you know, with someone picking her up or her being drive to, driven home. Um, but there was a question, why didn't they arrest her right then? Or why didn't they search the trunk? Well, at the time, they had no, you know, no reason to really be searching the trunk or to arrest her at that time. They didn't know anything was going wrong until they did tow the vehicle. And during that inspection, they found her son's body. But if they had searched the vehicle or arrested her or did anything without proper cause or warrants, documentation, then anything that they found could have been thrown out of court. So that's why I was kind of thinking about why they, re um, or why they searched Brian's vehicle. But some of these same questions will arise a little bit later um, about the importance of paperwork and all the logistics, um, specifically about, you know, obtaining evidence or how things are charged. Now, as we see in a lot of cases, what the defense ends up arguing might be different than what was originally stated by either the victim or the perpetrator. So while initially Bill said that he didn't know who was at the door, the defense later 
used the defense that Bill tripped and accidentally shot the gun. The defense said that Brian and Bill were very close and that they, quote, come from a loving family. They're the kind of sons that any parents would be proud to have, end quote. So, you know, the defense was kind of arguing about the character of the victim and the charged criminal or alleged criminal. So I'll just kind of leave that quote there and let you kind of come up with your own opinion about that one. And actually, the defense did rely on a lot of character witnesses that would be testifying on behalf of Bill. Now, the prosecution would be arguing intent. This hinged on the expectation that since Bill knew that he had just threatened a store owner with a gun, that he was expecting law enforcement to show up. Therefore, when he shot the gun, he knew or probably perceived that it was a police officer, making things you know a little difficult for the prosecution after this was that Brian would actually be testifying on his brother's behalf. The first day of the trial was mostly spent finding a jury, but they were still able to have three witnesses give testimony on that first day. One of the witnesses was the store owner um, that had been threatened by Bill. This is Kay. Now, like I said, his brother's name, first name is Muhammad also. Um, His middle initial is A, so that's how I'll refer to the brother. But Kay actually knew Billy or Bill. And this answered a question that I had in how did Kay and the police know who to arrest or go after? How did they know that Brian would have been Bill's brother? So since Kay knew Bill and actually had known him for around 11 years, then that kind of helps with that question. You know, he could tell the police officer the name of the person who showed the gun and made the threat. I almost wonder if they knew each other from high school um, because an article actually states which high school Kay went to. And even though I didn't see um, Bill's high school listed, they were close to the same age. So I'm kind of figuring that's how they knew each other. And we do also find a little bit more um, information about the incident at 7-Eleven. What happened is Kay was on his way to work, driving there early in the morning. Bill was driving very fast and, you know, Kay actually noticed this. He saw that a vehicle was following him very closely. Upon getting to the 7-Eleven parking lot, Bill was said to have slammed his truck door against Kay's vehicle and then, quote, glared menacingly, end quote. Now, continuing on as nothing had happened, Bill entered the store and was actually in there before Kay even got in. Bill asked for some cigarettes, which he purchased, but after doing so, Bill went outside, calling Kay back out to the parking lot. And when he did so, he opened his shirt and let Kay see the gun that was within his waistband. Now it was Muhammad A., Kay's brother. Um, He did actually see part of the gun as well. So that was a second witness to the fact that Bill had a gun on his person at the time. Other testimony from the day included testimony from Sergeant Robert Hobbs, who was part of the Easton PD. He confirmed some of the other information that had already been reported in previous news coverage, um, reiterating that while taking the report at the 7-Eleven, Brian came up to the store and upon hearing what was going on and, you know, again, kind of clarifying how they knew who the person was with the gun, Brian said that he would go to Bill's house and try to find him and get him to turn himself in. While listening to his radio, Hobbs heard about the 911 report or call that came in from Bill's house. So, of course, he rushed to the scene. 
There he found Bill holding Brian in his arms, saying, quote, I shot my brother and I think he's going to die, end quote. Now, this does lead, lend credence to the fact that he did not intentionally shoot his brother. Not necessarily the fact that it was an accident or not, because by saying he shot his brother, he's not saying whether it, he pointed a gun or whether, like the defense was saying, he tripped. Brian took the stand on Tuesday, April 7th, which was the second day, and testified that Bill did not shoot him on purpose. After being shot, Brian said that he called Bill a moron, and that's when Bill realized who he had shot. Brian stated that he did tell first responders when they arrived that it had been an accident. So this was not a case of who done it, but a case about whether or not there was intent. Either way, we are talking about someone who had a gun in his possession, someone who reportedly reportedly knew Kay um, and made a threat towards him. Most of that stuff is not in dispute in any way. Early on in coverage of this case, um, one police officer said that Bill did smell of alcohol and that he did have the gun on him at that point. So we have to think people are not supposed to drive when they're impaired by alcohol. People are not supposed to operate boats or heavy machinery when they're impaired. So, you know, we probably can say pretty convincingly that they should not be walking around with a gun in their hand. The defense's case did continue and included Brian's testimony as well as Bill's girlfriend and two other friends. They all stated they had seen him in the hours before sh the shooting and that he had not seemed angry or upset. And this seemed to be to show that he was not acting in a violent or aggressive manner, but just that he was fine, everything was normal, according to his girlfriend and his friends. Now, a trooper named John Ballinger reported on some of the statements that Bill had said after the shooting. Bill said that he had been asleep when he heard a loud banging on the door. And, you know, again, this is within 15 minutes of the 7-Eleven incident. So this means he would have, you know, arrived at home, went inside and fallen asleep in about a 15 minute time frame. So granted, he had been under the influence of alcohol, according to most accounts. So possibly he, you know, kind of stumbled in and blacked out. But again, very quick time frame. He said that he fired the gun and saw someone fall, but reiterated that he didn't know it was Brian. Now, this is according to what an officer stated Bill had said after the shooting. We have to go back then to the defense um, argument saying that Bill tripped and that's when the gun went off. So there leaves a question here in the statements. But the defense did catch a discrepancy in Bollinger's report. The typed report did not include any report of Billy saying that he shot at the door. Um, so this was a big question about why Bollinger was saying this on the stand but had not actually typed it up in the report. The officer said that he had made these notes in his handwritten notes because the statement about not meaning to shoot his brother was reported to him by another law enforcement officer. Bollinger decided to keep it just in his handwritten notes, but not put it in the typed notes. Um, according to Bollinger as well, Bill kept saying, that he shot his brother and then asking if he knew what that felt like. While not putting that statement in the typed notes could throw a wrench into the prosecution case, I can understand why he didn't actually put it in the typed notes, but it does complicate some things. Now, according to the defense, Bill again had tripped while approaching the front door. Brian stated that he quote, 
saw his brother fall down and then a flash, end quote. So this means Brian could see supposedly through a window that Bill was coming towards the door, tripped, and then the flash came from kind of down low. Um, however, at no time that night did anybody report hearing Bill say that he shot the gun as a result of him tripping. Now, Brian's story had remained consistent throughout you know, the whole case, Even when the police initially interviewed him three weeks after the accident or incident, he told the police that the shooting was a result of him tripping or his brother tripping. However, in the prosecution's corner, we had a gun expert that said the gun would not fire unless two safety catches were released. So also um, the user would need to depress the grip safety while pulling the trigger. So Basically, it seems pretty unlikely that someone would be able to fire the gun while tripping. Ultimately, Bill was convicted of five counts. These included the carrying of a handgun with intent to injure and reckless endangerment. The charges that he was convicted of were actually all misdemeanors. And even though they were misdemeanors, the charges could carry anything from $250 fines to five years in jail based on the offense. The sentencing guidelines would suggest that it was five years in jail. However, depending on the judge's discretion, it could also lend itself to not, no time in jail, according to the defense. They could even look at, if he was sentenced to any time, that it be suspended. Now, looking at the case, even in April of the following year, and this is, you know, April after the shooting was in August of 1992. So we're looking at April of 1993. Brian was still receiving physical therapy for his arm. Bill did not have any prior convictions, so the defense was kind of banking on that to try to get no jail time for Bill. Now, in kind of a twist here, one of the jury members was interviewed after the verdict, and they said that the defense and the evidence that they submitted actually convinced them that Billy was guilty. So remember when I talked about how the actual typed report from Bollinger didn't include some of the things told to him by another officer? Well, because of this, the handwritten notes were then put into evidence so that the the jury could see all of the notes and there was information about how Brian was trying to quote, calm Billy down end quote. Um, There was also information about Bill having an argument with his girlfriend. So this kind of gives an eye into the mindset of what Bill was going through that night as well as drinking. So Those were possibly factors into all of that. So when the sentence was handed down, Bill was sentenced to five years. His family was extremely upset. They were crying when the judge presented the sentence. Um, He also, it appears, had to pay $250 each for the five charges um, because the total was $1,250 in cents. Fines could be 250 for each of the charges. It looks like, you know, it was all five that he got the, the $250 fines for. Judge Horn explained that the reason for the sentencing was understanding that this case, while affecting an entire family with both the shooter and the victim being brothers, that this should be an example about what drug abuse can do. So in this sentencing, we do find out more about Bill's background. Um, While not presented in any of the articles leading up to that point when covering the case, um, with further investigation, they did find that Bill had started to use marijuana when he was just a young child in the fourth grade. He began to drink beer by age 13 and used cocaine in his high school years. 
Judge Horn said, quote, this is one of many sad days for you and your family. The only consolation is that it could have been worse. At least your brother is here today. He came close to losing his life, end quote. Bill Sr., who was the father of the family, said, quote, I never thought something like this would happen to my family. Let our family start to heal and give us an opportunity to put something back into the community, end quote. He was saying this because he was hoping that the sentencing could have just been community service where Bill and Bill Sr. had also offered to be part of it as well, would give talks to the community about, you know, the effects of drug and alcohol use. The prosecutor, you know, did aim to use the guidelines of a minimum five-year sentence. And so with those arguments, the judge still did come up with the five years as a sentence. Something that will come up later, though, is the defense did argue that this could have different interpretations about whether the five years was a mandatory sentence or if it was up to the judge's discretion. And a lot of the thoughts regarding that was about the intent to injure. Reading through those last articles, it kind of sounded like the defense was still clinging to the story of Bill tripping and falling and not meaning to shoot anyone. The judge, though, did look at the bigger picture, and frankly, I agree. He looked at what the two other brothers, Muhammad K and Muhammad A, had to go through. You know, one brother was working in the store while seeing his brother come in to start his shift. And then they were both confronted with someone who was under the influence of a substance, they wouldn't have known what the intent of Bill was, and they didn't know what his next actions could be. So given that Kay was closer to the gun and, you know, most of the verbal altercation, if not all, took um, took place between Kay and Bill, still, these two men were confronted with, you know, this person with a gun while they were just trying to work. The judge stated, quote, K did not deserve to be threatened by a drunken gun-wielding hoodlum, end quote. So that was the judge's, you know, one of the judge's reasoning for giving him the five years. On kind of a personal note, I knew someone who did work at a liquor store and was robbed twice in just a little over a year. She was shot in one of those robberies. She found another job after the second robbery. It was definitely understandable. She needed to get out of there. But that left aspects of trauma, not just physical trauma, but emotional trauma. She had worked at that store for a while and liked working for them, but you know, ultimately she gave it up because she felt unsafe. And so how would that affect Muhammad K and A from working at the store that they owned? How did they feel after the event? And I really think that needs to be looked at as well. Now, as does happen often, in um, convictions, the defense said that they were going to appeal. Now, Bill would be eligible for parole after just one and a half years. So going from 60 months or five years as the sentence down to just 18 months or one and a half years um, is what he could be let out after. Now, one psychologist did come forward to give testimony, and this psychologist had been treating Bill. Um, Robert Blatchley said that, quote, had it not been for alcohol, I don't think any of this would have occurred, end quote. So you might be sitting here thinking, well, everything is pretty straightforward. You know, you have someone who obviously had a gun. Someone was obviously shot. That's not in question. 
So does the appeal really have any merit? Also looking at the fact that he was sentenced to one and a half years, by the time things went through the court system, most likely you know, that one and a half years would have been up. But the appeal actually continued to go through even though Bill was released. So going through an appeal would not do anything about Bill serving time. He had already served the one and a half years, but the defense still continued on with the appeal, which must have been to try to get the the pardon or the acquittal um, just to get that off his actual record. That's the only reason that you would think someone would go through that appeal in that case. And he won. Bill's defense put through or put forward an argument that convinced the appellate court to grant a new trial. While there were a few reasons given in the appeal, um, which I read through the whole judgment on the appeal and there is or there was tons of case law that they kept referring back to, but I'm kind of going to try to focus on just a few aspects of that. One is that that they thought that the cases should have been severed, meaning that the 7-Eleven incident was separate from the incident at Bill's home. Um, the defense had actually requested this. And while that was not reported, at least in what I saw of any of the articles, um, that that was something that the appellate court said should have been granted. They looked at it as two separate cases. In reviewing the appeal, this is where I'm going to start to give a few of my opinions a little bit more than I did previously. My thoughts on this were, if someone commits a robbery and then while speeding away from the scene, hits someone and they die or even severely injured, you would think that those events would be connected and that they would be tried together. Since Brian was going to approach Bill because he knew that the 7-Eleven incident had taken place, and they all happened within 15 minutes, I personally would think that they had, that it was one continuous case. But the appeals court did not see it as such. So that was one reason for the overturning of um, the ruling and the granting of a new trial. Another reason given was a lot of rhetoric about intent and general and specific intent. It does appear through the appeal document that they didn't really buy the whole tripping and the gun went off story. But within the general and specific intent, there was also discussion about voluntary alcohol use, voluntary inebriation, basically and how that affected intent as well. So I found this kind of mind boggling because they thought that the fact that he was intoxicated should have played a role in the judge's sentencing. And this just makes me confused because, you know, they looked at intent, yet if someone drives a vehicle and is drunk, And, you know, again, using an accident as an example, they hit someone and they die. That's not forgiven. That's not, you know, saying that, oh, well, they didn't intend to kill anybody. No, I don't think anybody would intend to kill someone when they're driving drunk, drunk, but the fact is they did. So while normally, you know, if you hear cases of that, they don't get you know, 50 years in jail or anything like that, but they still serve jail time because they took a life. 
even though they were intoxicated, they are still tried. And if the jury you know, decides that they are guilty, then they are given a jail sentence. Sometimes I think those sentences are more than a little lax. But why in that case is it different if someone has a gun while they're intoxicated? So that's kind of where my mind went when looking at the intent and everything there. Um, they did agree, though, in the fact of whether or not he believed it was his brother that he did fire the gun and, you know, intent passes on to his brother. Meaning that, you know, even if he thought it was a law enforcement officer coming um, and he accidentally shot Billy because, I'm sorry, Brian, because he didn't know it was his brother, it still was intent. Yet that was overturned because there was a law in Maryland, it may still be there, that allows someone to basically carry the gun in their house. And because everything happened from within the home, then technically there was not the charge of, you know, having the handgun which kind of negated all of the other issues with the case because he shot the handgun from within his home, his residence. Then the handgun charge was dropped. They said it should never have been a charge. So that just kind of changes everything and makes absolutely no sense to me. But I'm not an attorney. I'm not a judge. I'm just someone kind of looking at the reports of things and trying to figure out where we ended up with having the appeal go through and, you know, Bill being able to get a new trial. Now, as does happen when there are cases where um, a decision is overturned, a lot of times there's negotiation and both the defense and prosecutor are looking for some type of plea deal. However, the defense kind of had their heels dug in and they were very, very intent on getting the bare minimum punishment for Bill, which yes, that's their job. But I think we can all agree that he shot his brother. Nobody disagrees with that, but we continue. And after months of negotiation, which went on between September of 1994 and March of 1995, there was finally an agreement reached before a new trial was started. Um, there were no specifics really given on that agreement. Um, however, the only charge that could have brought any prison time was the handgun violation. So since, you know, the handgun violation was thrown out, he was not going to serve any more prison time. Also, in the state of Maryland, if someone does appeal and gets a new trial, they cannot get any more of a sentence than they were originally given. So I have seen in some states, say someone gets an appeal, they get a new trial. And in the end, they actually get a higher sentence. Um, in Maryland, that would not be the case. And since the handgun violation, you know, again, was the only one that carried any jail time. Either way, he had already served his one and a half years and there was no way that he was going to get any more time in jail. The only silver lining to this, I guess, is that he did end up serving that year and a half, even though that particular conviction was eventually overturned. It does make me think too, since he had paid a fine did he get some of that fine money back since, you know, he didn't technically have a conviction for all of them? That, that thought just kind of came into my mind. But So as the court process kind of came to an end, um, we hear some things from the judge, which it almost seems like he had done a 180 in the way he was approaching the case. That may have been because of the ruling of the appellate court. But Judge Horn seemed to have a lot of empathy for Bill's family, which I do understand. 
Um, but at the same time, someone was shot. The judge said, quote, you have suffered greatly. You have suffered first of all the pain of your brother suffered. You have also suffered the loss of your freedom. Thirteen and a half months seems like a lifetime and you can't get those months back, end quote. Now, if you could have seen my face when I read that, you would have been able to tell I was not impressed. Um, the defense said that having a record would have made it hard to get a job. So, yes, it would. I understand that. But I also thought, is it harder for his brother Brian to get a job or certain types of jobs because of the injury to his arm? The last report in regards to the function of the arm that I found was that he did have nerve damage. And what about the family that owned the 7-Eleven? They had to face someone who had a gun. And in the appeals document, you know, according to information from that document, Bill was verbally also acting aggressive um, towards the brothers. So, you know, it wasn't just even a silent threat. You know, he was, you know, telling Kay to come out and showing him the gun. So that seems like a threat to me, but that's just my opinion. When all was said and done, though, Bill did not have the conviction in his file or on his record. So with all that he did with showing a gun to someone while verbally being aggressive, while shooting his brother who may have permanent damage, you know, again, didn't see anything after the articles. But after all that, he didn't have any felony convictions. He had somewhat of a fine to pay. Now, it was said time and time again that Bill was remorseful. Um, Bill said, quote, I just like to say that I'm sorry to my family and to the county, everyone who felt hot, highly of us and me. I've let a lot of people down. I'm sorry to everyone involved, end quote. What I find missing from that quote is, I'm sorry, Kay. I'm sorry, A. I'm sorry that I went into your store and showed you a gun while you were just trying to work. I'm sorry that I hit your car with my truck door. I'm sorry if this has affected your ability to work with some sense of safety. Nothing. I did not hear him say anything, at least in the quote that was provided when he was saying that he was sorry. I didn't hear anything about A or K. That is, you know, kind of upsetting to me. Also, let's think about what might have been. Looking at it from Brian's perspective, he got shot in the left shoulder. So a little more to Brian's right, he would have been shot in the heart. What would have happened then? Would he have been charged with manslaughter or what? Based on some of you know the appellate reasoning, he may not have been charged with manslaughter and then his family would have had to you know, face that that one of their sons shot their other and possibly killed him. Now, again, that did not happen. He was shot in the shoulder, but it still left long-lasting effects. And, you know, it, it was an injury where he spent two weeks in the hospital as well as, you know, rehabilitation time for that shoulder. Looking at the fact that Bill did not have a record prior to this, you could argue that he did not deserve the maximum punishment. And I can... I can kind of agree with that, but, you know, a, but I think in a case where someone recklessly lets a gun go off, whether he thinks he shot at someone he knew like his brother or whether he thought he was shooting at law enforcement is a pretty big deal. Now, as a reminder to those who may not have heard me mention this in a previous um, episodes, I do have family members in law enforcement. I do have a family member who was killed in the line of duty while trying to apprehend somebody. He was shot and didn't get to go home to his daughter that night. Now, I am not going to say that every police officer is absolutely wonderful. I will also be one of the first people to say that if a law enforcement officer does something bad, that they deserve the punishment as well. But we're not talking about that in this case. We're talking about a law enforcement officer or anybody approaching a door and being shot at 
there is some argument to the fact that Brian kind of kicked at the door. He said he thought that Bill might be asleep. So he kicked on the door, which could be, I guess, perceived as threatening. But, you know, again, you don't know who's there. It could have been a police officer at 2.30 in the morning they're probably or 2.45. There probably wouldn't have been anybody else other than someone that he knew or a law enforcement officer. But it just kind of boggles my mind that, you know, he could shoot somebody and threaten somebody um, previously and not really get any permanent punishment for it, meaning he didn't have a conviction on his record. So this is where I come up with some of the questions that, you know, I think we see sometimes in cases. One is, one of those questions would be, what happens if the victim does not want to cooperate or testify for the prosecution, that they actually end up testifying for the defense? How does a prosecutor approach that? How do police approach that? While this is a little bit of a different case, we see this a lot in cases of domestic violence where the victim is called a non-cooperative witness or something to that same effect. What role should police and prosecutors take in something like that? Now, again, while this is different than most cases where um, police usually encounter this, we have to recognize that it does make it difficult for the prosecution to win. But we also have to look at it from the side of the victim and if they feel any pressure. And that pressure can be one of many different things. It can be, you know, thoughts of physical violence against the victim or pressure emotionally or mentally, such as if you testify, you'll break a family apart. If you testify for the prosecution, that's going to be punishment for someone that you love. So it's not always just the thought of physical violence that may make a witness not cooperate. It could also be emotional pressure, whether from someone else or even themselves. You know, it doesn't necessarily need to be from someone externally saying, if you testify, you'll put somebody in jail. It could be you know, the victim himself or herself saying that I don't want to see someone punished. I don't want to see someone that I love go to jail. And that emotional pressure leads them to either not testify at all or testify for the defense. I'm not saying that it was necessarily the case here that Brian felt that pressure, but it does make me think about you know, what type of pressure or thoughts victims may have when confronting having to testify. And possibly, should there be a therapist or someone that can work with the victims beforehand, regardless of which side they're going to testify um, for, to help them through the process? Also, what role should civilians play in approaching someone that may be violent? In this case, we have an, a civilian, Brian, who approaches police who... Both admit they know that Bill has a gun. The police and Brian both know this, yet the police allow him to approach his brother with no controls in play. There's not even an officer who's standing off to the side to try to help with it. It's just he goes to his brother's house knowing he's drunk and has a gun. I kind of feel that, you know, a, a civilian shouldn't be going to do something like that, even if it is his brother. I'm sure that they thought, well, he's never going to shoot his brother. And normally, no, he would not have shot his brother, but he didn't realize who was coming at the, coming to the door, who was kicking at the door. So he did end up shooting his brother. With the police approaching it, they could have had, you know, if there was resistance, having a negotiator, we do run into the problem, though, that he would have still shot through the door and then would have shot a police officer. So this all goes back to intent for me as well, and that he intended to shoot someone, in my opinion. Again, this is just my opinion. Um, intent is sometimes very hard to prove. So 
it's just my opinion that he may have thought it was law enforcement coming. And it concerns me that a civilian was left to approach the door. Another question is bail. When should that be given? Now, when Bill was released, he was released um, first to the inpatient rehab. Um, And then once he was discharged from there, he was supposed to live with his parents. And it was supposed to be a, quote, gun-free environment, end quote. So this would mean that if his parents owned any guns, that they would have to get rid of them while Bill was staying with them in that gun-free environment. But at this point in time, we have a guy who had a gun, legally it sounds like, but he shot it not knowing who was at the other, at the other side of the door. And even though he may have completed an inpatient program, you know, there's really no way for his parents to control him 100% of the time. What if he was able to drink some more or get drugs you know, and started to act in a similar manner? What would have happened then? Yes, the probability of anything happening, happening like that would have been, you know, um, greatly decreased by him living with his parents. But it's not unheard of for someone who comes out of rehab to even if they have a good period of staying sober and not taking any drugs, there's always that urge. And what happens, you know, if there is a gun or if there is something there that may incite violence, you know, an incident that may incite violence while he's under the influence. I'm kind of speaking in general terms as well, not just in this particular case, but in others where it seems like we're in this quandary, this question of how much is too much bail? Is it fair if bail is set very, very high for someone who can't afford it? Um, as well as kind of balancing it against the safety of the community. You know, we want to make sure that everything is done fairly and equitably, or at least we should want that, and that the question of bail or bond makes it very difficult at times because not everybody has the same resources. In this case, the original bail set at 325000 I would say is kind of reasonable considering he shot somebody and threatened another. But that is definitely something that would be unattainable for most people. And then, you know, it was dropped to the point where they could afford it. But, you know, we are in this kind of limbo about how much is too much. What what about those who cannot afford it? We're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. But some people are in jail for long periods of time before they even go to trial because they can't afford bail, but at the same time, violent offenders who may have actually committed a crime get out on bail and can be a threat to the community. So that's a whole big can of worms that I think nobody really has an answer to right now. Now, What's equitable and fair to everybody so that you don't have potentially innocent people sitting in jail for months or even years, and you don't have potentially very dangerous people out on the street just because they can afford a higher amount. It's a very, very tricky and sticky situation, which I myself have a really hard time balancing in my mind because I have heard of so many people who've been in jail for a year or more and ended up being either acquitted or found factually innocent or they're in jail for a nonviolent, non-threatening crime. And in the meantime, they lose their job, their home, custody of their children while they're in jail and have to restart their lives when they get out. But just when I saw the amount of the bail drop from 325, 325,000 to 25,000, it just made me think a lot. And now to something that goes back to that first case I was telling you about, a case where two brothers um, were both in jail for different offenses, yet they were both um, murder offenses. And that was Allison Lamont Norman and his brother Shane DeShields. Who's there to help a child when they're going through 
any type of emotional turmoil, or in this case, when they're using alcohol and drugs at such a young age. In the Norman and DeShields case, there had been abuse previously, and I'm not saying that there was abuse here. I'm just giving or going back to an original example that I had, um, but they were not given the counseling and the therapy that they needed to get through that. So in this case, we have Bill who is taking drugs, drinking alcohol at such a young age. Was there something going on emotionally that maybe a school counselor could have caught and tried to get him help? You know, so again, to reiterate, I'm not saying that there was abuse, but it could be any type of emotional turmoil um, that he may have been going through that kind of led him to take those drugs and drink like that. So where should the schools, the community kind of step in and try to address these concerns? I find it kind of hard to believe that someone in the fourth and fifth grade who's, you know, smoking marijuana, you know, doesn't show some symptoms to school counselors or teachers or anyone else for that matter. But apparently that's what went on here. And I just kind of have to wonder if someone saw something, did they say anything or were some signs ignored? And then this whole thing might have been able to be avoided if you know, he had not been drunk. I think that's pretty much what a lot of people um, say as well. But if he had gotten help earlier on, even as a young adult compared to being 26 when this occurred, there's probably dozens more questions that I can ask at this moment. But for this case, I'm just going to leave it here. Otherwise, we'll go on for three or four more episodes. But I do sincerely hope everybody in this case is doing well, Um, that the brothers who own the 7-Eleven, A and K, that they're doing well and are still successful. And hopefully what happened here did not cause any long-term stress while working, you know, especially overnight shifts at their store. I hope Brian is recovering well and hopefully through therapy has um, either complete or better use of his arm. And I do hope that Bill did get help that he needed to overcome the drugs and the alcohol. It has been 30 years, so so much would have happened between now and then. You know, it would make Bill in his mid-50s and Brian in his early 50s, um, Muhammad K and A are probably somewhere in there as well, um, since K would have sounded like he went to school with Brian or Billy, I'm sorry. So I do hope everyone has done their best to overcome this and are doing well. And that's why I didn't want to use full names, you know, because it is something that's a lifetime ago to a lot of people. And while it was an act of violence, Thankfully, Brian was not killed. I do also believe in second chances. So hopefully Bill took that chance and you know is successful and is happy that everybody is happy. So here ends today's case. Um, I have a few different ones that I might you know put on for the next episode. So I'll probably be looking at um there are some shipwrecks that I have some research that I've started. Um, you know, something other than a true crime case. I'm looking, you know, for something to kind of break up the true crime after true crime because sometimes that can be a lot. Um, I know I do listen to a lot of true crime, and I do like to kind of intersperse that with some history and things like that. Um, so. I'm not going to say exactly what the next episode will be because I'm not sure which topic um, I'm going to choose yet. Um, But I hope to talk to everybody really soon and have a good one.